All right, everyone. It is episode time, and we are here with Euphemia. Said it right. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Euphemia Ooh. Russell. Yes, did it. Uh, Euphemia Russell is a full spectrum pleasure coach and author of Slow Pleasure. And we are here today, particularly to talk about flirting and non-sexual or maybe non-genital. We'll see what happens. Touch um, between lovers, partners, etc. And so this will be geared towards folks who are single or dating or in long-term partnerships. Maybe you've been married for 5,000 years. I don't know, uh, but it will have something for you. Uh, and so let's just dive in. You already heard a little bit about Euphemia in our bio, but Euphemia, can you please tell our listeners where or how you got to where you are today in the field of sexuality? Where are you right where now? Are you? Where are you located? <laughs> yes, yes. I need your social security oh number. <laughs> <laughs> I've got stop <laughs> I always get asked my Genesis story and honestly, I wish that was like a really simple moment where I was like, and then the light bulb, but I suppose it just, I felt a sense of, I see pleasure as a way of aliveness and I felt a sense of aliveness in my own life that wasn't really reflected in society as a whole. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And so I suppose it was my own curiosity and my own desire that led me to find spaces where I felt more alive more permission giving and more expressive and particularly body focused things. And I think that inevitably that combination leads you to pleasure, body pleasure, sexual pleasure. And so I started actually, I'm Australian, but came to California to do a training in sex education, I think nearly eight years ago. And cause I saw it as like a hub in the world of this Did kind of permission busy? giving. Yeah. Did, oh, yes. I saw that in your. Okay. I, yeah. Because I did Smithy in 2008. Oh, okay. I saw that. Is that, that what you, is that the training you're talking about? Yeah. It was oh, it's awesome. one of the trainings I did. But That's yeah, San Francisco I, sex information, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Which was cool. so amazing because there's nothing like that still in Australia. So I came over and did that and then slowly came more and more into being like, wow, I can make this work. This is not just a side project. And then, yeah, slowly but surely got further and more and more into it and then realized I was like oh so sexual pleasure for me is one part of a spectrum of pleasure and I love that and also I want to explore the whole spectrum so now I call myself a full spectrum pleasure coach um, and I see that sexual pleasure was like a back door into this whole like universe of possibilities and choices and I was like oh wow yeah. so it's forever emerging forever changing shifting and that's really fun for me too when you say backdoor, I think of way different uh, <laughs> things than just an opening. I'm like, mm, that's okay. on purpose. That's that another is definitely on purpose. avenue. <laughs> <laughs> the Pandora's box of all the things. <laughs> and Euphemia's pronouns are they, them. So when you folks out there listening hear us talk to Euphemia, and we do refer to them as they, them, because that are that is your pronoun. I saw your robot. <laughs> I do. Uh, 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 I am bro. So just to make sure everyone knows, because. Um, um, sometimes that that is it's a switch for me um, to get comfortable uh, with uh, making sure I, I speak correctly too. So if I do fuck up, Euphemia, you give me a a slap on the Zoom call, okay? No, <laughs> An air, no. On the airways. Central. You don't spanking. need to feel vigilant. I'll <laughs> okay. correct you if it feels too jarring, and if it doesn't, I'll let it slide. Okay, yeah. good. See, that's the thing. It's like gentleness and, and amazingness. So, uh, I love this uh, introduction to who you are. I know you're also an author, which is really cool, and we'll get to that later. So, let's talk about flirting because flirting is so fun. <laughs> but how do you define flirting? Because this is a vast topic. It is such a vast topic. First and foremost, I think that flirting makes the world go round. And it's like the ultimate social lubrication. And that, in my opinion, so I see myself as um, poly intimate, which is seeing that there's many types of intimacy in our lives. Um, I'm non-monogamous, but I also see myself as poly intimate. And one of those things is like decentering our romantic relationships or sexual relationships as being the kind of pinnacle. And as an extension of that, I just flirt with everyone because it, in my opinion, flirting is the dynamic of seeing someone and seeing them as special and being present with them in one capacity. And then the other kind of capacity of flirting that I see is that you are allowing others to witness you in your pleasure of yourself and of life. Mm. 
And when you boil it down, it's just like, oh, I see you and I'm admiring you or I'm appreciating your existence in the kind of simplest, most pure form. Um, and then in a more charged sense, it's like, hey, how much do you want to see more of this? You want to see me more alive? What would that look like? So, yeah, I think there can be a really sweet, wholesome version of flirting that is just acknowledging people and making them feel special, even for a fleeting moment to the like charged possibilities and kind of tension and anticipation. And I think that like half of pleasure is the anticipation as well. So you're like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be sexual at all. Flirting does not no. have to be sexual. No, you can flirt to be like, I really like that lighting in your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. In lockdowns, um, my nesting partner and I would have like, the biggest news of the week would be like, I went grocery shopping and I flirted with everyone that I walked past. <laughs> I was like, so exciting. <laughs> hey, that's that's actually really healing, especially during the summer. I should should have been doing more of that. Jeez. I do that. I'm like, did you see this beautiful apple that I have right here? Even with a mask on, <laughs> I am smiling underneath <laughs> this mask. It's hard exactly. to see. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, that's a whole you don't story. Hard to be verbal and flirt, right? You oh, flirt your eyes. Body. We're going to go. We're, we're getting gonna, there. We're getting yeah, there. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. jumping ahead. I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. <laughs> I have a question about flirting. Okay. And, and I mean, you kind of already answered this because you went and flirted with the whole grocery store and you have a nesting partner. So, <laughs> so my assumption is flirting just something single people do or people dating, or is this just something that people in partnerships can do? Can we continue to flirt with each other forever and ever? Mm, you mean when you're in a partnership with someone, can you keep flirting with them? Yeah. And but, uh, oh. yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people think of flirting as this initial thing. It happens in the mm -hmm. beginning phases. And then you're in a partnership mm -hmm. and you don't flirt with your long-term partner. And this might be more like, you know, heter heteronormative relationships. But, and I know a lot of people who are in long-term relationships are like, I wish we still were flirting, you know, making out, doing all the kind of more like lighthearted, sensual, getting to know each other, getting curious about each other things. So mm -hmm. I know, okay, I'll stop talking. It's about you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love your perspective and clearly you think about it a lot too. So please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the cheesy thing that people talk about of like choosing your partners each day and again and um, coming back to the relationship and being like, oh, who are you today? And how are you today? And that flirting is a way to just be present to how we shift over time of like, hmm, who are you? And the amount of times that... I do that in my relationships is every time I find it just creates this kind of tension. Uh, you know, we talk about the sort of third space or the kind of space between people. And I think that anticipation of flirting creates that, you know, Esther Perel and like mating in captivity, that kind of long-term monogamous relationships and how to bring desire or tension or that kind of I don't I don't like attraction terms, plus like, spicy, obstacle spicing up. Right, exactly. that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that flirting of creating that space between and a little bit of space to breathe in a relationship is so fun of being like, oh, are you a stranger to me today? Who are you? I want to know you. How are you today? And be like, oh my gosh, I just noticed who you were in this moment and just turned around and was like, oh. And so in short, yeah, absolutely. I think. I'm just a flirty person, even with myself. Mm. And that is just so fun to bring back into a relationship again and again. Wait, how regardless. do you flirt with yourself? How? I, okay, I, this is not on our notes, but how does one <laughs> flirt with yourself? Is this like looking in a mirror and being like, you're looking good today, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I am... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you say this is shameless sex, but I'm like, how many shameless parts of this podcast is there? We'll see. But I went to a party recently. It was a few days long. It's in a hotel. It's an immersive art experience party. And it, there's so many art experiences, like all in the different rooms. And I spent a good hour or two on one of the nights just dancing in my hotel room in front of the mirror and having the best time. I'm just being like, hey, who are you? And I do a lot of intuitive movement every day as part of my own somatic and pleasure practices. And that is a way for me to be like, oh, just curious and wondering and like 
intrigued by how I might be today and how I might feel today. And that to me is like witnessing myself. You know, we spoke about at the start of, of it's just like being witnessed in your pleasure, in yourself and life. And I, I can do that to myself. Yeah, that can get that can get a little complicated. But I talk a lot with my clients about how you can how to come back to focusing on what feels good rather than what looks good. Mm. But then observing yourself in what feels good, for example, in the mirror can be so charged and exciting without trying to do what looks good even for yourself in the mirror. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that's that's a, a good lot of layers to that. <laughs> that. But that's the thing. That's a good turning point to talk about. I've met so many people and you female, if you have as well, I'm curious to know that say they're bad at flirting or mm-hmm. I don't flirt or, and I remember there's been times in my life where I've had partners or friends and be like, you're such a flirt. And I'm like, really? Am I, is that flirting? I didn't really, I didn't realize I was flirting. And I just love that back and forth energy exchange, whether it's communicative or, or using body language. But the question is for folks, whether they're your clients or for folks out there that they think that they're bad at flirting, can they learn more confidence? Can they become someone that is quote unquote, a good flirter? Um, or what can they do to up their flirting game? Mm. I think it's coming back to what I just said. I think a lot of people see flirting as a performance and that it's about coming back to noticing what feels good in you and then allowing yourself to be witnessed in that rather than defaulting to the gaze of someone else. First and foremost, focusing on what feels good for me and then allowing someone else's gaze to witness you in that experience. And that often I think people, when they're like, I'm bad at flirting, it's like, it's a game and it's something I have to master. And I need to have like all the strategies and steps and the one liners and the like, no, like three, two, one touch and brush their arm. And that can get so (laughs) heady. Yeah, Yeah. So heady and stressful. And so if it's coming back to, okay, how can I keep coming back to what feels good for me and then allow myself to be witnessed in that, that becomes so much more satisfying practice to be like, oh, even if it doesn't work out, at least I had a good time and I got to practice coming back to like, how do I want to feel in this moment? How can I bring 10% more pleasure in this moment? Or how mm-hmm. can I allow myself to like play with that? And mm-hmm. then it can be satisfying regardless of the outcome. I love that. Yeah. The, I want an episode where we talk about really hilarious one-liners at some point. Just, uh, where, just, just this, much, that, much, like, it? yeah, just like one, because one-liners, <laughs> there's an art to it and it's ridiculous, but I'm like, I think of funny ones just for like my, my own in my own give me a, give me a good when one i liner. flirt with myself nice <laughs> shirt amy want to fuck <laughs> <laughs> while she's touching my shirt it's actually not that soft <laughs> if i didn't know you i wouldn't have touched yeah. you <laughs> she has his consent um yeah i do well, actually that do brings... you like pizza me too you want to fuck <laughs> <laughs> do you wanna, or do you want to just oh yeah well that, <laughs> yeah it doesn't always have to be about fucking but that's like what come, a couple April's of my one night F. okay so uh, <laughs> uh well that brings me to this is again a little bit of a tangent but with what april's talking about so i've always identified not always uh because i don't think i was great at flirting when i was two but i think i was too flirting honestly um i've always been really into cocks everyone and just so you know like that's been like not big, chicken cocks. No, no, like not the, like, 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 <laughs> like penis owning, like penis <laughs> owning stools. And I, and I feel like in my twenties, I really nailed <laughs> the flirting game. And recently experienced flirting with a vulva owning a female identifying person who is super hot. And mm-hmm. I fucking don't know how to flirt. I'm like, and mm-hmm. and she's like this too. She, with she, vulva I, owners, yeah. And you flirt I mean, with me all the time, bitch. Yes, I, yeah, this is true. But I also am like not trying to like, you know, have sex with my sister. So, but she and I both talked about this. We're like, we're really good at flirting with penis owners. Like we've got that shit down, but like this, and then we're, we're literally like 15 years like, <laughs> it's all awkward. It's like everything <laughs> flew out the window. And so I don't even know what my question is here other than like, I guess here's a question. Can we go through iterations of learning how to flirt? Like, and feel like we have it nailed or dialed in, in certain areas of our lives. And then all of a sudden, and, and I guess, this what comes to mind for me too is people who feel are you know they're single all of a sudden like i've been in a relationship for 20 years i haven't flirted since it was 1999 and now the game is different or i just feel out of the loop so i think i answered my own question (laughs) what do you think about that (laughs) i mean can relate flirting with femmes and women is so much more intimidating 
because in a way I care more about that. I'm like, oh, what do you think of me? And it's it's new. It makes me feel like I'm building that skill back from adolescence and being a teenager and kind of coming into my 20s and be like, <laughs> <laughs> but I also think it's a really interesting because I think we've been socialized to think that flirting requires initiation, which requires a particular amount of pressure. And that often that pressure and initiation is so associated with the people who are men or socialized as men and boys. And that when it comes to a dynamic of like a queer dynamic of femmes and women, that they're like, oh, I don't want to replicate this kind of harmful way that I've learned about flirting and that kind of very 90s sort of chasing the woman until she says yes and asking again and again like I don't want to replicate that because that was really harmful and that really sucked and then therefore there is no tension and that it can often kind of flock because it's like oh I don't want to pressure you so I'm not going to even express my needs or my desires or make any assumptions or ask you any questions or put you on the spot and then it just fizzles out and so I think it's coming back to seeing that initiation and pressure doesn't mean persistence it doesn't mean violence it doesn't mean disregarding no's or boundaries but it's how can you create pressure that creates tension that creates intensity and allows an opportunity to actually arise. Mm. And so a lot of people are like, oh, flirting is all about being vague and mysterious. But for me in queer dating, I just practice being like, hey, this is really vulnerable and really exposing, but I would like to kiss you. How does that feel for you? So that's or, I would yeah. like to kiss you. <laughs> I would like to kiss you. Do you feel the same? Or, you know, a million different variations. Or like just nice shirt, want to kiss? <laughs> April, <laughs> April's version is so like just to, yeah no I like your flirting version You're I like, like a 10 year old boy like yours, I, I am I it. am I totally am I was just making a joke because that's what I my brain went to like yeah I could use that like nice shirt you want to kiss we've always talked about April being like a uh, 18 year old frat boys so. <laughs> <laughs> <Her> rock star <laughs> yeah no. I mean one of the ways that I love flirting is saying like oh I would like to flirt with you. Does that feel comfortable for you? And then being like, oh, and I've done that with many people. And then being like, oh, actually, uh, no, not not right now, but maybe in the future. And I'll be like, cool, okay. And then other times I'll be like, oh, wow, me? And I'm like, yeah, you. And they're like, I didn't even realize. And I was like, oh my gosh, I would have been flirting with you for months and you would have had no clue if I didn't say something. So mm. I think clarity not just consent and like respect, but true, clear requests are so hot. I like that permission to flirt. I like that as well. And I'm curious about your tips on where folks can learn how to be better at flirting. And um, I'll get there for a second because mine, I think a lot of my shit comes from some of the the films or the dramas or, or, or we were talking about White Lotus, the, the series mm -hmm. before we started recording. And sometimes I see things in television or in media when I'm watching and I'm like, that is a genius way to flirt with someone where they just say something so simplistic and beautiful that's not very wordy. And mm -hmm. they call that in, just say something like what kind of, you know, whether it's like, what kind of kombucha are you drinking? <laughs> and you're like, it's elderberry. <laughs> you know, I, just, I don't know. There's so many different things. So anyway, that's a side note. So I'm curious for your tips, but calling all you single people, if they're out there mm -hmm. right now, let's talk to those folks. What are your top tips for flirting outside of relationships? Hmm. When I talk with clients about going on dates or like expressing interest to people I say just see it as a practice you know go on dates with people that maybe you're not really sure about as a way to practice and just get more comfortable in your own experience of expressing yourself and flirting and I think that that is one thing is that we are all so fumbly when it comes to pleasure when it comes to relationships when it comes to communication because we were socialized and grew up in a society that has really put it on the back burner and made it embarrassing and shameful. So thank you to you two for making it shameless. And that that means that we're all so fumbly. And so it's just about practice. 
and it's not about mastering it. It's not about having some good game or anything. So I'd say practice being comfortable in yourself, regardless of the outcomes. What I said before about a practice of you being witnessed in pleasure and what feels good for you so that all of your expectations and pressure isn't on someone else and someone else's response. And that's so much more fulfilling. And then practice just expressing desires and wants and needs in everyday life. Because I talk a lot about like the accessibility of pleasure. I talk about like microdosing pleasure in everyday moments and slow pleasure. And so that we can get more comfortable with it for the weightier moments, like in sex, if there's a moment and you're just like, I can't say anything because I haven't built up the capacity to be able to even express something in this moment. And so practice in the small moments and be like, Hey, can I have that apple? Or like, (laughs) Hey, and just like flirt with the grocery store people flirt with anyone and just try it out in the less weighty, less pressure moments. And so I suppose that kind of comes back to practice too. So yeah, I suppose I would distill it to practice in the small moments, have fun and be centered in your own experience so that you're not putting pressure on other people and then work out through each time you flirt, what feels good for me rather than how am I performing for someone else? And hopefully that will just help to like reveal more and more of what is your natural language for flirting? Because there isn't one way. I think that flirting is as unique and individual as like our pleasure mapping and what brings us pleasure and why. And so it's like find your own flirting language. It seems like, so yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things here because it seems like one piece is we're getting comfortable with rejection or it not going the way that you hoped it would um or you know or if you're set on an outcome like anticipation anticipation, well every time i go and flirt with the person the grocery store if they are no or they're like oh why are you talking to me you know then i'm like (gasps) devastated instead you're like going into it more with this openness of like you said practice going on dates that might not be you know that that awesome and meeting you exactly where you want to be met or might be awkward or or well maybe not uncomfortable but um so what so what if you are met with that what if you are met with and i don't want to use the word reject what was the word that you wanted to use April like if you're met with more like someone who's well if you get like the cold shoulder yeah like that you're like, like I re- oh you look re- really not uh, that's a really nice apple and they're like Ugh. they're like oh Why or they don't even maybe stink face you but they're like they, they give you just the cold shoulder where you don't receive any sort of what you maybe weren't going for or looking for but they don't give you anything they're like, not, they put you on ice they yeah. ice your ass they're like oh that's even worse that than is, like that the, is worse I, I don't even know what, yeah, yeah. they mean no words. like just cold shoulder yeah cold shoulder or like don't talk about my apples there's the last four <laughs> I mean, perhaps the flirting is not a direct ask of someone like in the grocery store. Maybe it's just like, oh, I'm practicing being witness while I pick my apples up from the shelf and being like, hey, without being like, hey, want to go on a date? And maybe that's just like building up being like, oh, that person was like looking at me and that helped feed my sense of being seen. And that felt really sexy without it necessarily feeling like, oh my gosh, every time I do this, I'm putting myself in a position of being rejected or misunderstood or potentially coming across as creepy or... So yeah, have less pressure moments like that, I think. And then with rejection, I think that expressing your needs and your wants makes you inherently vulnerable. And that part of that is becoming okay with disappointment. Mm -hmm. And having more of an intimate relationship with disappointment and then coming back to yourself in that experience. And I could talk a lot about disappointment because I I talk about this in general of needs and wants and disappointment. And that often when we express our needs and wants, if they're not matched or they're not aligned, then how beautiful is that to know and to be able to prune that experience or that person out of your life in that capacity anyway and be like, oh, cool. Well, at least we're clear and at least I know and at least I practiced and at least I'm honest with my needs and wants. And that, in a way, is more important. Mm. But of course, there I think there is a tolerance that we need to build over time to disappointment and to rejection. 
and that if we keep focusing on our own experience during it, then there will potentially be less disappointment of the outcome and more like pride of like, oh my God, I did that thing regardless of how it was going to happen. I'm so proud of myself for naming that and expressing that and then still having fun with it while I practiced Mm -hmm. and being able to hold both. Like there's room for both in that moment of like, I'm so proud of myself and that was fun. And oh, that's a bummer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like there's also like a component of maybe, uh, oh, is it Charlie Glickman who said this? I think Charlie Glickman who said, um, Mm. rejection is not a rejection of you. It's of the the opportunity of or the actual experience. So it's not because, you know, if I go and flirt with April, I'm like, hey, hey, April, I really like your shirt. And April's like, (sighs) and, you know, April doesn't know. Well, April knows who I am, but say, you know, she didn't. And I'm just a stranger hitting on her. She doesn't know who I am, the wholeness of my being, you know, all the ins and outs and inner workings of Amy. So she's not necessarily Did rejecting you think Amy. you're a creepy stalker. Yeah. yeah. I was like, do you know where I live? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, or, but we're at the grocery store. So I really like your apple. And she's like, don't, um, okay, uh, bye. And you know, so instead, it's a rejection of uh, us just interacting and not actually me as a whole person. I really liked when he said that because really? I thought that was kind of helpful for people. I, but easier said than done, right? Like I can tell myself, you're not rejecting me. You know, you don't know me as a whole person. You're just re- rejecting me and the apples uh, in this moment and not the wholeness of Amy. And But yeah, I can still feel what you're talking about. So I, I like what you're saying. You're like, hold the disappointment there and get comfortable or like familiar with it. And also see that this is a learning opportunity. I wait. I have one thing to yeah. ask though before, because before Amy has another question, Euphemia. So you can compliment people without it being flirtatious as well, right? Because I feel like I love complimenting folks, and I don't try to flirt, but I'm like, yo, I just love like the the smell of your perfume or the smell of your cologne, or I love those pants. And uh, I never consider that flirting, but I have been told before that that is flirtation or when I receive compliments from other folks out there that I'm being flirted with and I would disagree. I'm like, no, I don't think that was a flirtation. I think that was just a compliment. So is there is there some sort of it doesn't have to be polarizing, but is it is there a difference between complimenting someone because you really dig their vibe versus flirting with them? Mm. I think we live in an era of complicated compliments where people (laughs) like the intention and the impact like can be very different. And particularly like in, in relationships that have existing power dynamics, like, you know, men on the street, for example, just that context, that dynamic hitting on a young woman, for example, like that is inevitably loaded with history. And so maybe the intention is different, but the impact, like not considering the context of the situation can make it feel like uncomfortable. And also perhaps say, for example, for me as an Australian, people in Australia don't really speak to people on the street and they like hardly even acknowledge people on the street. And so when I came to the US and I lived here, when people would say hello to me on the street, I'd immediately be like, what do you want? Why are you speaking to me? And so I think that it's really important that if you're giving a compliment that you're clear about what your hope or your outcome is for it instead of being like oh I really like your pants can I have this thing from you or I want this thing with you or I want this experience with you is very different to like oh cool pants I think that's that's actually quite uh, a reasonable response and I agree with you there are a lot of loaded compliments out there but sometimes there's also genuine people that actually do dig your vibe or want to know where you got your shirt and I'm not bringing back the sh- a nice shirt want to fuck thing I promise um I'm just, just saying there are times where you just want to compliment people and I just wanted to to, to get your clarity uh, clarity or uh backing on that so moving on What about Mm -hmm. within relationships when it comes to relationships, because people are in long-term relationships, maybe they think they can't flirt anymore, but what are some ways to continuously flirt with your partner or partners? So many ways. I think it's the in-between moments and they're like the non-sexual, non-loaded moments. It's just like, oh, I'm making my coffee and suddenly I turn around and you're there and you're like, oh, hey, I forgot you were so hot. Or I forgot you are so beautiful. And just looking at you is such a beautiful reminder. Like that can be such a simple way to say like, hey, I see you and I appreciate you. And I'm excited by you without any, as we're just talking about, like any expectation or any kind of 
hope of it being returned or having some favor fulfilled. It's just, I see you in the small in-between moments. And I think that that on its own without like sexual flirting is such a beautiful way to build intimacy in those in-between small moments in a relationship. And I have lots of like ideas and practices that I do of flirting more with more intention and more hope and expectation. But I think even just that completely can shift a moment of, oh, we're just two people parallel in a life. Maybe we live together. Maybe we're just doing this thing together. And suddenly our relationship feels like more practical things than it does exciting things. And, oh, pause. Hey. Mm -hmm. And that can just completely shift the feeling of a connection. Yeah, I I feel like this is a good segue. We're going to we're talk about some the non-sexual touch um and and how important that could be and um, within partnerships or dating or all the all the aspects. Um and I think that when it comes to flirting, you know, at least in from my ex- past experience, if every little flirt was about sex, you know, like, oh, you look good in that shirt, you know, or or like, hey, you want to fuck or you know, whatever. And yeah, the sure. shirt comes yeah, up in your shirt. every time. I would be I would be like, but what about me? Like, what about the whole version of me? I want I I do want those kind of in-between subtle moments that don't have to be related to sex or feel pressure about sex or about sex or about my body. And I want to hear all the things too. I want to hear about my body and my appearance and uh, but I want to hear about my intellect. I would like to just receive your eyes and just like a hello or um Mm -hmm. you know a sticky note on a mirror that's just like you know love you hope you have a beautiful day or whatever maybe that's not flirting but i mean it's like so there's the compliment thing um or appreciations which which april is really fantastic at she's one of the best um appreciate appreciation machines out there are you flirting with me i'm flirting with you right now yeah yeah (laughs) yeah and it's you know it's it's an important uh thing for a lot of people and maybe and maybe not everyone so so bringing this to the non-sexual touch piece. So how does non-sexual touch play into all of this? You know, why is it important or beneficial to potentially uh, explore, offer, cultivate, curate non-sexual touch with partners or lovers? Intimacy, exploring the whole spectrum of intimacy and to decenter sex as the only reason for touch, I think is so important. My nesting partner and I, we do every week, we do experimenting sessions is what we call them. And in each experimenting session, we show up to that session and we say to each other, okay, here's the list of all the things that we want to experiment and explore together. But how are we feeling today? Mm. How are we feeling in this moment? What are our needs and desires? And often that experimenting session will just be, I would like you to touch my genitals, but in a non-sexual way, just to like have them be touched. Or I would like a massage, or I want to have a bath with you. I want physical intimacy in some particular way without there being that kind of escalator of, oh, as soon as my partner kisses me, immediately from previous experiences, I assume that they want to have sex. And how to kind of decouple that expectation of how can we have physical intimacy and exist and feel close and co-regulate our nervous systems and be like oh it feels so nice to be safe but like charged with you and that I think that kind of container of the experimenting sessions of showing up and saying hey how do we feel right now doesn't have to be sex but how do we want to prioritize time together where we can be physically intimate in some way builds so much intimacy and that so much is communicated through touch that is really hard to communicate in words and that if we only associate touch with sex or sexual intention and desire then it can make it really one-dimensional um and flat and also a lot of pressure particularly if there there's a relationship where One person has more of a responsive desire and one person has like more spontaneous. It can get like really complicated. I don't know if your listeners 
know about responsive and spontaneous. We've but... talked about it, but I don't feel like we could, you know, we, have, we could definitely up, talk about it even more. So <laughs> yeah, I think it's helpful. And I'm one of those people who's um, identifies as being highly responsive as, a, as opposed to spontaneous um, mm. in, in pretty much no matter what relationship dynamic I'm in. Um, and, and have been in relationships with people and my current partner is, you know, has a very highly spontaneous sex drive, which I'm like, damn, I really want some of that. And, but, but there is a lot of this, um, working together and, and he's also really doing kind of what you're talking about. Like just because his hands go on my body doesn't mean he assumes we're having sex just because his mm-hmm. hands go on my genitals doesn't assume that we're having sex. And in fact, he's mm-hmm. totally happy with like, I'm just going to massage your vulva. And actually once I even passed out, like like not passed out, but fell asleep while he was massaging my pussy. It was awesome. The external part of <laughs> my labia. Um, and I fell asleep and he's like, that was so cute. You know, like that was so sweet. <laughs> and so I think there's just something really special about that, about it not having to be goal oriented. So mm-hmm. you named a couple ways here you talk about like you know drawing a bath or i would like you to just kind of you know, caress my arm or um what are do you have any other ideas for people like i don't really know about this whole exploring non-sexual touch thing do you have any other w- ways that they might be able to explore this or initiate this with partners yeah i think there's so many different ways and obviously it depends on like what you're into and what you like in life but it could be um like taking sexy photos of each other where you get to kind of have that touch or be able to witness each other without it being sex and finding ways to kind of have non-sexual touch and also kind of charged but non-sexual interactions and to be able to be like oh we get to explore like that kind of dynamic and that tension between us without it being on an escalator um, and feeling that pressure and so I think there's the the obvious like sense things of everyday life, like, oh, we get to ex- experience a beautiful meal together, have a bath together, give each other massages, all those more kind of obvious sensual experiences. But perhaps it's like, oh, I want to go to a sauna and have sex in a sauna together. I want to go to the beach and I want to explore just like giving each other a massage in the water or in a hot tub, or in a hot spring, or whatever it may be. And so I suppose I suggest to people to go through each of their senses and write like a library of their senses and the things that they enjoy. And maybe it's like, oh, I really enjoy saunas. It's like, okay, how could you share that experience with someone else? You know, how can you do that for you? But how can you invite someone else into that experience? Or like, oh, I really love walking and looking at the leaves on the trees and just taking the detail in of the world around me it's okay well why don't you hold hands go on a walk and like look at the details of life together and that often I forget what his name is but I, I think about this all the time so I should look up the name but that guy that did the research around the success of long-term relationships of how he could predict like divorce by you know, spending five minutes with a couple or something. And one is of this the Ian Kerner? Is, is it Ian Kerner? That I don't know if it is No, maybe Ian not. Kerner. Okay. Okay. Could be wrong. Okay. I don't think so. It's a little more old school than that. And one of the things that he talks about is that, of that kind of turning towards where it's like, oh, look, there's a bird in the sky. And if the partner or lover turns to us and like, oh yeah, that's a moment of kind of engaging. And so being able to have those moments of intimacy that are non-sexual or have those moments of intimacy that are touch but non-sexual is such a way of building multiple languages and multiple ways of connecting that diversify. And like I talk about like pleasure spectrum of, hey, let's find our overlapping pleasure spectrums and explore all those things together. So like literally writing a list of all the senses and all the things you love and then be like, oh, how can we do these things together? So I don't want to be too prescriptive and be like, here are all the five top ways that you can do non-sexual but touch related things. But yeah, find what you like, find what you love and how it makes you feel good and then how you can invite other people into it. So vague, but also inviting, hopefully. So you're saying if you're on a walk and you say, hey, look at that. 
look at that beautiful tree and your partner's on their phone to be like, damn it. Cause that's what happens to me a lot. I'm like, Oh my God, look at that beautiful thing. And he's uh-huh. like texting and I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, I just was having a moment. I was like, I thought you were getting it. I was flirt trying to flirt with you. Um, and then I get usually mad and I'm like, put your phone away. We're, we're having one-on-one time right now. And he's like, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I just got a text message. And I'm like, God damn it. So I think the intention though, sometimes when you're in partnership, it is, it's hard. Cause you, you automate, you automate so many pieces yeah. in long-term relationships, at least from my experiments. And I have been a serial monogamist and long-term relationships are difficult. And I am, I, I am monogamous, right. And, and I haven't really explored the non-monogamy world and I respect it so much, but that's one thing that I feel like sometimes in the, the poly world or the world that is vast of non-monogamy and, and relationship styles, I feel like you have to fucking pay more attention because otherwise people will be like, yo, you do not give enough attention. And I have like 20 other partners that probably would. So well, like, okay, okay that per- that's, yeah. I, I want the amount of time they have in their lives. <laughs> yeah, I'm being like, wow. yeah, damn, yeah. <laughs> They're superhuman. Yeah. yeah. They're really good with time management. Yeah. <laughs> that was, have jobs. Totally. <laughs> but, but for those people that are in long-term relationships and you feel me, you can tell me if I'm full of shit, but it's like, Pay attention sometimes to the nuances that are existing within your partnership. Pay attention to the times when Mm -hmm. maybe you do have to look at that text message or ping from your socials or that email that came in. But if your partner's speaking to you, maybe take one pause of 20 to 35 seconds and listen to what what they're saying and flirt with them back and then be like hey babe do you mind if i answer this email that just came in i've been expecting like fucking hell i hope my partner <laughs> listens to this and i'm like well, told you it reminds me of the um the concept i think it was john <laughs> gottman um they were talking about bids um and so like you know the yeah. bid would be yeah. yeah so you're going april's going for a walk and like oh look at that and they're like uh-huh and then you you know your bid just got turned down to like hey right. my bid yeah. is will you connect with me and it got you know, turned down and then you get turned down over and over and over again. And then it creates April's not resentful, but <laughs> so you stop bidding, you yeah. stop caring. Yeah, you give, and yeah. then you start to seek things from other avenues, not necessarily other people, like from but Amy. it could be from shopping, from social media, from hanging out with friends. And then you start to turn away from maybe what you really wanted in the first place, which was connection with your partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even if it's that simple too. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, I think that's really important. I'm glad you said that because that's that. I think well, when Euphemia said that, I thought of my partner, I was like, I have totally been in that boat where I've been walking in a park and like, look, look at, at the bird, <laughs> beautiful bird. And I look and he's on his phone and I'm like, motherfucker, dude, bro, I was just thinking that to you right now. Share the bird with me. The, yeah. Do we get consent from the bird? Uh, okay. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people can relate though. And I've been there on all sides. Like I'm not a perfect uh, human when it comes to always being present. And I know that there's times where I'm energetically not able to meet my partner's bid, you know, of, of, Hey, here's a moment to connect. And I think that we can at least try our best and create awareness, especially when we know that it's important to one sustaining connection in general. Um, it's fulfilling. It really is mm-hmm. fulfilling for me in April or April and her partner to look at the bird in the sky and to appreciate life. And even if it's, even if it's the simplicities of life, even if it doesn't have to do with sex, you know, this is a way of being alive. You started this with your whole, you, I like how you said your Genesis story and mm-hmm. um, that, uh, you know, there's an, <laughs> this aliveness piece. And I, I, I agree with April with that. Like there's an aliveness there and I don't think my cell phone's given me a lot of it. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it's helpful for podcasting. So keep listening, everyone. Call it more anxiety than aliveness half the time. So you feel <laughs> sorry about the tangent uh, at the end. That was great. Uh, you two are like a, do you do stand up comedy together? Cause you should. <laughs> no, she I should. <laughs> I, I'll be your sidekick on the side. I wanted to be on Saturday night live and I have wanted, I wanted to do acting school when I was younger. My mom was like, and I got accepted into a, a school in New York. And my mom was like, actors are always drug addicts and they're always unhappy. And I was like, are they really? No, <laughs> but uh, that would have been the opposite though. So just so you know, yeah. <laughs> super happy. Yeah. Podcasters are great. Uh, so, so anyway, that was, Thank you for that compliment, though, Euphemia. That was like, that charged me up. Is that a flirt? Because I feel like you were just flirting because I would be like, yeah, I saw that. For sure. For sure. I mean, how you were saying that you love giving appreciations. I fucking love giving appreciations. Oh. People are like, oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Like, how nice is that? People just for sure, that. It's flooding. 
they deserve to be appreciated. And I, and I'm sure Amy will agree. I won't speak for her. However, I appreciate having you on the show and all of the beautiful information, tips, and insight. It was pure insight and wisdom, really, uh, that you shared with us about flirting. Because flirting can sound really maybe amateur or basic, yeah. but it's not. There's yeah. there's some technicalities and some deep uh some deeper layers to flirting that I think we did cover pretty extensively on this show. So thank you for sharing that and being such a beautiful, wise human sex educator. I know you're an author and this brings me to this last point because we do have to at some point in the show because everyone has lives out there, whether you're listening <laughs> or you're Euphemia or Amy me and I, um, who are writing a book right now and never stop having her heads in a laptop. Uh, so <laughs> that being said, if people, I, I, I believe you do one-on-one slash work with, uh, couples and do somatic coaching. Uh, if folks want to find your book or they w- would love to work with you and learn more about flirting or perfecting just their relationship game, uh, whether they're single or couples, can you tell people how to reach you also any social handles? If you have those would be great. And how do we buy that book? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, just to respond to what you said before, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And thanks for appreciating me back. Look at us being a mutual appreciation club. That's very cute. I like your shirt too. Okay. <laughs> I like your earrings. They're real nice. My corn earrings. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I like from the Midwest. So corn, hello. It's the way to my heart. Well, I, I like I like your sense of humor. Um and uh that board in the back behind. You look like you were okay, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm trying to outdo April. You had her at board. <laughs> it is my pleasure, Pudge. Yeah, that's why I was so, going with you. Yeah. You should come over <laughs> sometime when you come to LA. Let me know. Um, but yeah, my work. Yeah, there's various different ways. So I do only I only take a couple of one-on-one clients and I do a minimum of six months with them. So that kind of opens every now and then. And then I do one-off sessions that I call potency sessions that I offer twice a year. So that's in terms of coaching. And then I offer group spaces. So one is called Unfurling, which is an intuitive movement and intimate coaching space. That's like 35 people. And that goes to six months. And it's basically like unlearning the socialized characters that get us in a way of kind of being tight and small and limited in our sense of pleasure and disconnected from pleasure. Then I have Microdosing Pleasure, which is an audio library of lots of like two to 10 minute recordings or what I call rememberings. So you can like listen to them anytime, any place, any day and be like, oh yeah. Cause I think that pleasure is about remembering rather than kind of learning or perfecting or, ma- or mastering. And then my book is called Slow Pleasure, which is a bestseller, which is so cool. And that can be found on, in the US, it can be found on bookshop.org is where I send people or Amazon. Um, and it is in bookstores, but without knowing where you are, it's easier to find online. And then my social media handles is my name. So for Instagram, it's euphemia.russell. So people can misspell that, um, but you'll just put it in the show notes. So check there. And then for TikTok, it's euphemia. And then my website is euphemiarussell.com. What a beautiful name, euphemia. What does euphemia mean? I used to think it, um, or I was told that it meant to speak well. So it's like EU means good in in Greek and PHEM means um, to speak. And then I found out that like the really original meaning means to speak well of the gods. And then before that, it just meant silent reverence of the gods. So I was like, okay, super casual. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> low key, just low key. <laughs> wow. That's that. Well, you, you wear this name beautifully and so well, and you speak well and you, uh, whether it's the gods, the sexual gods are smiling down yeah. upon you, Euphemia. So thank you for sharing all of this with our shameless listeners, shameless sex. We love you listeners out there. We call you our shameless sex revolutionaries. You don't belong to Amy and I, but we love you so much. And Thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show, please, 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 I beg you, please 
go rate us on iTunes. You don't have to give some long drawn out review. If you do, we do read every single one. Spotify as well is taking reviews. You have to listen to an episode on Spotify. And I would appreciate because I've read some of the reviews and they're they're really lacking uh, any sort of, of general context. So if you can just go listen to an episode and rate us, it's really simple. It'll take two minutes out of your day, maybe less. Uh, you can do a fucking emoji if you want. Okay. If it's a, if it's one of those what, like rain shed ones, I love those. A like squirt. the wet, I want to yeah. squirt the yeah. wet ones or the smiley. I don't care. Whatever you want. An eggplant, a peach. Uh, give a me a puppy face. Yes. Give me, give me what you got. Uh, so that said, we do appreciate and read everyone. Also, I'm going to invite you just one time if you listen to our show and if it's okay, if you fast forward ads, I know I watch shows when I'm, I'm at home and I watch TV and I'm like, Oh, fucking commercial God. But then sometimes I do learn new uh, items or, or, or now there's so many things that aren't consumable goods to buy, like physical products. There's actually things like therapy sessions or really great vitamins, or there's so we have, we have apps about erotica, uh, OMG. Yes. There's so many different products that we sell on the show because we believe in them. And we do that because the show is free for you and we have to support ourselves. So by you buying things from our sponsors that we hand select very, very carefully, you are supporting Shameless Sex. So please do that. Uh, if you have the financial means, I know that it can be hard economically out there and we support you and we love you and it's free. So if you don't, that's okay too. All right. But we love you no matter what. Thank you, Euphemia, for being amazing. And we will see you again soon. And all right, y'all, get ready for another episode this Tuesday and next Tuesday, because we'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now.